Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson, and today we're at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Located in the heart of Harlem on 125th Street, the Studio Museum showcases artists of African descent. Exhibitions currently on display include the paintings and drawings of New York-based artist Kianja Strober, a selection of works titled The Jerome Project by artist Titus Kafar, and a collection of postcards made by various artists that evoke the essence of Harlem. The museum is open Thursdays through Sundays, offering free admission on Sundays. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz for Arts in the City. Music clubs in Harlem have a long and lauded history that you can be a part of any night of the week. We took a sample of some, not all, of the best Harlem has to offer for a great night out. It's a weeknight and Harlem is hopping. We're going to start out our evening at Minton's. What can you expect when you come to Minton's? <laughs> you can expect enchantment. Fantastic music, glorious ambiance, romantic, alive, and we have very good food. In Minton's, we do a concept I call Southern Revival Cooking with Low Country Notes. The food is very tasteful, very seasoned, and well-flavored. Music here at Minton's is, um, is fantastic. I'm fortunate, along with my business partner, Richard Parsons, to be the new stewards and caretakers of the home of Bebop. Bebop grew up at Minton's because Henry Minton, the original owner, was the first black delegate to the Musicians Union, and under his protection, professional musicians were able to experiment without fear of being fined by the union for playing without pay. And that tradition of warm welcome continues. I have heard you called a social minister for our time. I love that. When I opened my first restaurant, it was as if I'd opened a Southern Baptist church for myself because, you know, it was so celebratory and it was so warm. It was my opportunity to welcome people at my house. Hospitality is everything to me, you know, and if you've got fantastic hospitality and you can couple that with fantastic food and great beverages, you know, you've got a good time. The music was good, the dinner was great, but we're not ready to go home just yet. A quick walk up Adam Clayton Powell brings you to Paris Blues, one of the real deals in New York City jazz clubs. Along with being a heck of a good time, a night at Paris Blues is a significant part of Harlem history. In 1962, Sam Harvest left Alabama and came to New York City. His brother got him a job tending bar at a little place up in Harlem. And when the owners got ready to sell it, they sold it to me. Oh, this is the bar that you, this is your first job? Worked in, I actually worked in it, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. There's always some kind of famous or important person who would come in. Yeah, yeah I, I got one of the most famous people in Harlem living right in the block, Wycliffe Gordon. I, I knew him before he got famous. That's his picture right there on the wall. Uh -huh. In other words, when he, when he signed that picture to us here, he wasn't famous. <laughs> <laughs> now he's all the way to Lincoln Center. I, I, I applaud Sam. Paris Blues has been here. It's been a staple on this block for quite some time. And I've seen many people, um, you know, come and go. And I'll still stop by there um, every now and then. Paris Blues has no cover, free food, and if you want to hear up-and-coming jazz stars... We have the jam session, you know, where you can bring your horn or your guitar and join in. Any, any morning after the first set, anybody who thinks they want to play, they can come in. And it, it's, it's very good. All of the jazz players and blues players, they all come here. Of course, if you want to go to one place for the whole night, Red Rooster and Ginny's has got it all under one roof. Uh, the moment you walk into the room, there's this sense of place, this sense of arrival. Thelma Golden at the Studio Museum has been very instrumental in, in helping Marcus and I put together a visual art program that speaks to Harlem, speaks to uh, the caliber, world-class caliber of artistry that Harlem represents, and really the diversity. So when you layer that with the music, you get that sense of place, that sense of, wow, I'm not just anywhere, I'm in, I'm in Harlem, and it becomes like nowhere else. The food at Red Rooster and Jenny's really is a celebration of a comfort uh, dining experience that has an elevated touch to it. Marcus really is a master at blending flavors and uh, different tastes from different cultures. Why is this establishment important in the neighborhood? We 
set out to show the world that Harlem is important in every way. Harlem is a contribution to the cultural landscape in this world. And we provide a platform and a showcase to, to prove that. This has been Lisa Beth Kovetz for Arts in the City. New York City is a music lover's paradise, and nearly every major style of jazz of the past 70 years was born here. Our Tina Beth Pina takes us to the jazz corner of the world. Music is a river stream of different styles and sounds, and in New York City, the jazz genre flows right into Birdland. Can't get any better than Birdland, as far as I'm concerned. Cheetah Rivera is one of the legends who still performs at Birdland, the legendary club that Charlie the Bird Parker and Morris Levy opened in 1949. It was the highest quality jazz that was known at that time. Everyone came to New York and wanted to play on the Birdland stage. And they wanted to rub elbows with Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Sarah Vaughan, Billie Holiday, Charlie Parker, Coleman Hawkins, Oscar Peterson, Hank Jones. We can go on and on and on. And back at that time, too, the clientele was very integrated. Yeah, very much so. And this is what was so wonderful about Birdland. Jazz is an international language. So not only were we getting different colors of people, we were getting ethnic groups come from all over the world. It was a melting pot. And it also attracted some of the great stars of that time, Frank Sinatra and Marilyn Monroe. And these people, of course, love the music. I remember the Birdland from years and years ago. And to Dizzy Gillespie's and all of those guys that I knew. I loved the way they just played together. It's a thrilling thing to see musicians just playing jazz. Although Birdland had tremendous success, it closed in 1965. Charlie passed away in 55. They tried to keep it going, and it had its ups and downs. And most of the musicians were now going to Europe or other countries to find steadier work. Jazz wasn't where it was at the beginning of that period. Uh, so in 1983, I met Doris Parker, Charlie Parker's widow, and we decided to reopen Birdland in 1985. When I saw that it was opening up again, I don't know how many years it's been in this spot, um, but I went, wow, that's right, Birdland should always exist because of its history, because the, the greats have played here. I've played it several times, I love it, I love it. When you think about it, and the whole tradition, you know, I, I'd rather not even think about it, it's too much. But you know, it's an honor to be here, and to play in, by extension, the house that Bird built, you might say, and to carry on that tradition. Birdland's big band is just one of the many jazz acts performing here, and the club now includes all types of entertainment, including a Broadway at Birdland series. You're on a Broadway stage, first of all, you're not looking out in the house. Uh, you don't know who's out there. Uh, but here, you're really right in their laps. And um, that's what good live performance in a nightclub is all about. That's one reason why Cheetah really digs this room. You really feel as though you can be yourself. You're nice and close to the audience. So you have a relationship with them that's really really nice really it's like it's like <clears throat> your 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 living room on a bigger scale also the broadway at birdland isn't just superstars i love bringing in uh, up and coming talent and uh, songwriters and people that aren't necessarily at the pinnacle of their career yet it gives these these wonderful people uh, a place to to be heard Jazz is always changing, and one of the things that we think about here is not only sort of carrying on that tradition in its original form, but extending the tradition to appeal to a lot of different people. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Arts in the City.
Ignored and left to decay for almost 40 years, one of New York City's most palatial theaters has been restored and is now open to the public. Tony Gaida has that story. Once upon a time in America, movie theaters were fabulous places, as magical as the entertainment on their screens. Palaces of wonder, fanfares for the common man. Marcus Lowe insisted on it. Lowe was a pioneer of the movies, a visionary who said, we don't sell tickets to movies, we sell tickets to theaters. His theaters were magnificent. One of them was on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, its design inspired by the Palace of Versailles and the Paris Opera House. It was called the King's. The patron walked in the front door, saw this magnificent environment that they stepped into, and that's when the show started. It was in September 1929 that the King's opened. Sound had come to the silver screen. Talking pictures were the rage. It was a glorious time to go to the movies. You walked in here, and you, I guess you'd say you felt like royalty. Ron Schweiger, borough historian of Brooklyn, has a copy of the King's opening program. The celebration began at 11 in the morning with a musical production called Frills and Fancies, featuring the Chester Hale girls. Buster Keaton, Marion Davis, Conrad Nagel, and John Gilbert spoke from the screen to congratulate Brooklyn on its new palace. The crowning moment came in the evening when Dolores Del Rio walked on stage. One of Hollywood's brightest stars, Del Rio introduced the King's first film, Evangeline, a silent picture in which she starred. I cannot believe what I felt like when I was young coming into here. By the time Arlene Jacobs Ribbler first came to the Kings as a teenager, the place was no longer a gem of the jazz age. It was suffering the depredations of middle age. Nevertheless, she said, it made you feel rich when you grew up poor. We used to come here double dates and triple dates, and if we didn't like our dates, we would excuse ourselves and go to the bathroom and never return. Shame on you, Arlene. I know, that wasn't nice. But tickets were cheap, so we paid our own <laughs> way sometimes. But fewer and fewer Arlene's were going on dates to the Kings. 3,600 seats were impossible to fill. Television was the new fad. Flatbush was declining. In 1977, the Kings went broke and closed. Time and vandals ravaged it. It was a derelict. Matt Lambros started photographing the Kings six years ago for a book he's writing. Underneath the balcony, on both sides, there was just nothing left. The plaster work had all fallen down. Rain poured in through holes in the roof. The Kings needed a savior. Enter Bruce Friedman. I started the campaign to save the Kings back in 1987. Persuading a top theatrical company that there was gold in these ruins, urging the hiring of renowned restorers, the same company that worked on Radio City Music Hall and the Capitol Building, Friedman was relentless. $95 million in public and private funding, and 28 years later, the King's is back. Its ornate plaster walls, its walnut paneling, pink marble and elegant chandeliers fully restored or faithfully recreated. The King's is magical once more. It deserved a second chance, and it got it. Not only the theater deserved a second chance, so did Flatbush. After nearly 40 years dark, the Kings reopened on February 3rd. In the weeks ahead, this palace will feature acts as diverse as Sarah McLaughlin, Crosby, Stills and Nash, and the Moscow Ballet. I'm Tony Guida for Arts in the City. Fiddler on the Roof opened 50 years ago on Broadway and has consistently graced stages across the globe. Carol Ann Riddell recently sat down with the author of a new book about the record-breaking musical. If I were a rich man, all day long I'd pity, pity, bum, if I were a wealthy man. Fiddler on the Roof is a musical that has spanned generations, cultures, and countries. But the beloved production, which was at points in time both the longest-running musical and the longest-running show on Broadway, began very differently. 
Barbara Eisenberg is the author of Tradition, the highly improbable, ultimately triumphant Broadway to Hollywood story of Fiddler on the Roof, the world's most beloved musical. We caught up with her during a discussion of her book at Barnes & Noble, where fans gathered to mark the show's 50th anniversary. Jerry Bach, the composer, told me several years ago, he said, look, I am not being modest. We had no idea this is what would happen. Though Fiddler became an undeniable smash hit, early reviews were more mixed, and the production was worked and reworked to become the musical we now know. The only review they got initially was from Variety, and it was so dismissive. It was like four or five paragraphs, and they all, all the compliments were for Zero Mostel, mm -hmm. who played Tevye. And then the writers went through and dismissed everyone else. They were pedestrian. And the show changed a great deal between right. the time that it was in Detroit and by the time it ultimately got to Broadway. It did. It changed both in Detroit and in Washington, D.C. It's two stops before New York. Uh -huh. So when it was in Detroit, when it arrived in Detroit and when it left Detroit, the whole second act was quite different. And characters were gone. Huge production numbers started to go. Fiddler opened on Broadway in 1964. The story of a father and his daughters captured hearts both here and abroad. The musical has since appeared in many countries, its theme of family and tradition resonating with audiences worldwide. When Joseph Stein, the playwright, first went to Japan for the first Asian production, he was stopping to talk with the Japanese producer. And the producer said, I must ask you, I don't understand. How, how does this work in America? How, what, what are they thinking about? And Stein said, I don't understand you, what the question is. And, and the producer said to him, it's so Japanese. Which is fascinating. Yeah. It says so. It's very telling. Well, it is because it's also Finnish. It's Argentinian. It's, I mean, it's a hit in Senegal. From the stage to Hollywood, Fiddler was still on Broadway when the film version opened in 1971. Eisenberg explains it was shot in villages of the former Yugoslavia with great attention paid to authenticity. Some of those villages were still so much from 100 years ago that they didn't even have to do much to them. Yes. You know, but they did build their own village market. They built their own synagogue. And the marketplace was so realistic that one of the peasants in the, in the neighborhood tried to sell his horse <laughs> at, the, at their marketplace. Eisenberg recounts one of the challenges in making the movie snow, more specifically, the lack of it. When he had scouted out locations, Norman Jewison, he stood in snow up to his knees. But when they went back the following year to shoot, there was no snow, none. They tried various things, and finally what happened was they, they discovered there was a marble plant near where they were shooting, and they used marble dust. What makes Fiddler so magical for so many is its universal theme of family. It feels relevant. It feels like home. And for some of those who were part of the production early on, it was life-changing. My parents were European Jews, Holocaust survivors, who hated the fact that I was in the theater. They thought it was a waste of a really great education. And it wasn't until they saw me in Fiddler, went backstage, and talked to Zero in Yiddish for half an hour, and asked Zero, my father asked Zero in Yiddish, is he going to be all right? Tell me he's going to be all right. And Zero in Yiddish said, he's going to be more than all right. And that was a very important moment. It was exciting to be in the show from the very beginning. Uh, my, my mother was born on a shtetl, and my father was also from that area, and so it was very meaningful to me. It's a, a deeply compassionate and universal story. Carol Ann Riddell for Arts in the City. Donna Hanover looked into the origins of Fiddler's heartfelt story and how it changed the world.
Fiddler on the Roof, which opened on September 22, 1964, was not just a fantastic show, it became a cultural landmark. Columbia University journalism professor and theater critic Elisa Solomon says Tevya, a milkman in 1905 Russia, is dealing with the universal theme of unwelcome change. The tradition that is the life of Tevya and his family is possibly disintegrating. As a minority community, uh, and, and a, a weak community that is um, sort of, you know, under the boot of the czar in that period, absolutely. And then from inside the family, as the daughters who are sort of bucking tradition by choosing their own husbands are are showing the pressures of modernization. In her book, Wonder of Wonders, Solomon says Fiddler is based on 20 years of stories published in the early 1900s by a beloved writer, Sholem Aleichem. Tevya and his family ultimately leave home and head for the United States. 1964, again, it was a moment when, when America started thinking of itself as a nation of immigrants. That wasn't always in our rhetoric. That wasn't always our, um, our self-image. It was really JFK who was the first president who made that a very important part of what he talked about. And Fiddler, Fiddler caught that wave. Fiddler also spoke to a concept that was on many minds in the 1960s, the generation gap. The history of theater going back to Aristophanes, you know, tell, gives us stories of children who are trying to marry, a daughter trying to marry somebody her dad doesn't want her to marry. That's a universal theme for sure. But often we see that from the children's point of view. And in Fiddler, we also see it very much from inside the experience of Tevya. It's a show about, um, about figuring out how to be steadfast for the things that count and to be flexible where it's possible to be flexible. Fiddler on the Roof has been produced on professional and amateur stages around the world thousands of times, and songs like If I Were a Rich Man and Sunrise Sunset are beloved. Solomon says Fiddler was a watershed moment in yet another way. Fiddler gave Americans a sense, a sympathetic and rich sense of where Jews came from, at least Eastern European Jews. This was the first time that this world was represented for a post-Holocaust audience in English, for a mass audience, it was thrilling to people, absolutely thrilling to Jewish people, to see that world celebrated, appreciated, and embraced by the whole world. It doesn't have a happy ending. The first act curtain comes down on a pogrom, and the show ends with expulsion. The family has to leave. The family has to leave. It's not a happy ending, except there's an implied happy ending because Tevye and his family are coming to the United States of America at the end of the show. And there, two generations later, are their grandchildren sitting in the audience, knowing how well, in fact, they've done. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. When it comes to art, taste is subjective. Some may admire the cubist experiments of Picasso. Others may be perfectly happy with a poster of dogs playing poker. But for a better insight into the world of art, there's only one person we trust. Barry Mitchell in Long Island City. So you call yourself an artist. Stop it. You're terrible. You have no talent. Put down the paintbrush, step away from the easel, gather up all your pathetic attempts at creativity and bring them to MoMA PS1's Art Amnesty. I don't know much about art, but this sucks. Who's to say what makes an object a piece of art? What does it mean to create something? And how long should that last? And is it important that other people see it? I really like my art well friends. I really like my art well friends. Art Amnesty is the creation of Bob and Roberta Smith. 
actually a pseudonym for British artist Patrick Brill, known for his humorous, provocative, and political contemporary art. I'm a pragmatist. My manifesto is no rules. Make your own damn art. Do not expect me to do it for you. It's about throwing your art away. That's about uh, deaccessioning objects from being art. The dumpsters outside are the first thing you see when you come into the museum, and they say, throw your art away. And they are meant to be very in-your-face, very confrontational. And, and the way it works as a participant when you come in, if you, if you already know about the show and you have a work of art, you can immediately put it right in that dumpster. Um, there are other options. You can come up to the galleries and install them, as you see many people have availed themselves of that opportunity. What happens um, to the art when they put it in a dumpster? Everything you see on the walls here, in addition to the things that are in the dumpster, will also be disposed of. Jocelyn, tell me about these affidavits. So part of this project, in addition to sort of asking people to think about what art really is, is also thinking about the various institutions that govern art. And I think when we think of institutions like museums, like galleries, um, like corporations, we think of bureaucracy. And so part of bureaucracy is sort of the idea of paperwork and having to sign things. So as part of this, in order to even submit anything, you have to sign sort of a waiver, waiving your right to the artwork, and you also have to go through and sign one of, at least one of these three pledges. He calls them pledges. Yeah, that, that third one seems out of place. I never want to see this artwork again. I promise never to make art again. And then all of a sudden, encourage children to be all they can be. Choose art at school. And this one, um, really comes out of an experience that the artist had in his native UK. Arts education had actually been taken out of the school curriculum, um, and he was very passionate that this this not be the case. And so he supported it through this, through establishing a political party called the Art Party that also manifested through actual parties. We actually had an art party to open the show. And so it's, it's really a community engagement um, in general, this whole project. And, and that community can be adults that are sick of making art, but it can also be kids that are just discovering it. You don't have to be an artist yourself. You can just bring a painting you have at home that maybe you don't care for. Maybe someone gave you a piece of art you don't want. This is an opportunity to kind of uh, lighten your load. Maybe you hate the work for a reason. Maybe you just never want to see it again, which is one of the pledges that we have. This show is sort of a playful invitation um, to go ahead and use this as an opportunity to, to get rid of those artworks. I actually have an old painting. It's been in my garage for maybe 20 years. I don't remember where we got it or why we have it. I think it's an eyesore. And when I heard about this exhibition, I said, ah, I can finally get rid of that thing. Perfect. Can I show it to you? I, I would love to see it. Let's go take a look. Ta-da! Wow, that's pretty big. It's pretty big. That's about all you can say about it, right? Well, you know, I, I also think that those are some pretty sad sunflowers. They're very angry, sad sunflowers. I've never seen anything like it. It'll be nice to have it amongst all the artworks here on the wall, so thank you for bringing it in. Art Amnesty through March 8th here at MoMA PS1 in Long Island City. You know, they say art is supposed to move you. Sometimes you have to move the art to the trash bin. Barry Mitchell for Arts in the City. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories or to watch them at any time, go to our website at the link below. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and I'll see you next month on Arts in the City.